Welcome back to A and P, Chapter Eleven, Part Two. In our last action-packed, adventure-filled uh, lecture, we were talking about how muscles are uh, convinced to to contract, and so in this installment, we're going to actually see how they contract. But before we get started, I want to show you this little uh, video clip that I have. This is uh, the astrocytes in the brain. And you can actually see the electrical conductivity. I am always amazed by this. It's like you can see a thought go through. I'll back it up and you can see. It's like some of them fire and then all of a sudden it just sweeps across. Here we have electrodes. So there is a little button you push and a little charge of electricity jumps across here. But because this is touching it, it goes into the muscle instead of uh, making a spark across here. And then we saw the tracings. So every time the It, here's the muscle being stimulated right there so it's click 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 and up here you see the electricity and you see where the muscle twitches so there's the electrical charge there's the muscle twitching and all of a sudden it levels out like this What you've done is you have contracted this as much as it can. So instead of having a twitch, like we were watching the twitch, it's just going to contract and stay contracted. Right there. And that's tetany or tetanus. So let's look and see if we can figure out how that is happening. So both the muscles and neurons are electrically excitable. Because they have a charge across the membrane, they can depolarize and then repolarize. And the analogy that you're all familiar with is when you are charging your phone. So you charge it up, it's ready to go, and then you play uh, videos on your phone, or make phone calls, text, do whatever you do, and you run the battery down. And then it won't work until you recharge it again. So that's the same thing with muscle fibers, and that's the same thing with neurons. You're all familiar with going and buying batteries. You can buy a 9-volt battery, but you usually buy the double A's or the triple A's, and they're 1.5 volts, 1.5 volts. When we're down on the cellular level, then we're talking about millivolts. We're talking about thousands of a volt. There are different kinds of batteries. There are alkaline batteries. There are lithium batteries. In the battery that makes up our muscle cells, also known as muscle fibers, and neurons, which were once called nerve cells, are its sodium and potassium. So we have an imbalance of sodium and potassium across the membrane. And so the charge across the membrane is about negative 90 millivolts. There are more sodium ions outside the cell, and sodium ions are positively charged. So there is a positive charge outside the cell, and because there are not as many sodiums on the inside, we have potassiums that are are positive, but we don't have as many of those as we do the sodium. We have an overall negatively charged inside of the membrane. So that's why it's negative 90 millivolts. Once you have seen how you can stimulate a muscle, we saw using electricity 
And then we saw nerves firing, and those nerves can go on and pass information to other nerves, which can pass it on to, uh, eventually, to muscles. Or when we get into um, the chapter on hormones, then we'll learn about different hormones in the endocrine system that can cause a muscle fiber or a nerve cell to fire. Also, in the next chapter, when we're doing nerves, we'll learn about neurotransmitters. So we'll spend some time talking about things besides just acetylcholine. When you turn on your phone, you immediately start draining it of energy. So the same is true in a muscle fiber or nerve cell. You turn on the, the cell, and the sodium ions rush inside. So you, if you remember back when we did osmosis and diffusion, things always go from the high concentration to the low concentration. So since there's a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than there is inside the cell, as soon as you open up a sodium ion gate, it will allow sodium to flow inside the cell. At the same time, potassium rushes out. And once you equalize, where you have sodium rushing in, potassium rushing out, and you have depolarized the, the membrane, now you have, it's like your battery just ran out of steam. So you have to recharge it. So you're going to have to close those gates, and then you're going to have a sodium-potassium pump, and it's going to put the sodium back outside, and it's going to put the potassium back inside. And as soon as you finish this, now it's charged up and it's ready to go again. So it's waiting for another electrical stimulation or another chemical stimulation to cause it to fire. This depolarization, where the sodium rushes in and the potassium rushes out, and the repolarization, where you pump the sodium out and pump the potassium back in, is called an action potential. Since the sodium is positively charged and the potassium is also positively charged, in order to get an imbalance or to get a charge across the membrane, the sodium-potassium pump will pump out three sodiums and pump in two potassiums. So three sodiums out, two potassiums in. And this is going to require ATP energy to do this. It's interesting that we're at the ninth edition of Saladin's book, and I got this back from his first book when I was one of the reviewers. Um, they asked me to read over some chapters and look for errors. When you have the muscle fibers stimulated and the action potential starts and you have a depolarization event, it's like a wave and it travels down the membrane. So it says action potential at one point causes another one happening right in front of it which triggers another one and until you get to the end of the uh, electrically excitable cell. So this wave of excitation is called an impulse. So we talk about a muscle impulse or a nerve impulse. There are different kinds of toxins out there that can paralyze a muscle. Uh, one of them we talk about pesticides, things that you spray to kill mosquitoes and other things that we don't want eating our crops. Some of them have a cholinesterase inhibitor. And remember when you see the word ACE, it means it's an enzyme. So acetylcholine is one of the neurotransmitters that is released from the bouton of a nerve, and it degrades the acetylcholine, so you stop nerve transmission. But if you have an inhibitor, then the acetylcholinesterase can't work. And so you're just going to keep the acetylcholine in the synapse and you're going to have the muscle 
continuously firing, continuously firing, continuously firing. And if you continually contract, you can uh, possibly suffocate. So the trick is to get a low enough dose to kill the insects without getting enough of a dose to hurt us. And then there's another uh, toxin. You've probably heard about tetanus, and anytime you step on a rusty nail or something like that, then you're always supposed to go get a booster of your tetanus shot, and you're supposed to have a booster tetanus shot every 10 years anyway. And this is because in soil, there is a bacteria that is, uh, releases a toxin, and uh, it's a clostridium. It's one of the clostridium uh, bacteria. So it's not that you stepped on a rusty nail. If it's been outside long enough to have rusted, then the odds are it also has dirt on it. And so you push the dirt up inside of the uh, puncture wound, and it's going to end up uh, causing the bacteria to divide because, look, food, blood, all kinds of uh, delicious things in a nice warm environment. And then it's going to start making the, the um, toxin as a, as a byproduct, I guess. And that's going to cause you to have what we call locked jaw. So we knew that tetanus was usually fatal if you got it, and that's why we were so happy to have a vaccine for it. So when your child gets the shots when they're little, the DPT shots, they've added other uh, components to it, but a long time ago it was just uh, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, which was whooping cough. Those were the three biggies that they have vaccines for. Now we know actually what was happening. So you have 20 amino acids, and one of the amino acids stops motor neurons from making muscle contractions when you don't want them to occur. And if you have this tetanus toxin, it blocks the glycine. So you can't stop the muscle contractions when you're trying to. So it causes overstimulation and spastic paralysis of the muscles. Another neuromuscular toxin that can cause paralysis is curare. And they, they um, put it on darts. That's where we saw the South American natives were blowing poisonous darts. As soon as it got into the, into the person, it competed with the acetylcholine. So where you want the acetylcholine to be released and go across the synapse and then cause the muscle to fire, if you have curare, it's going to get in there and block the sites. So acetylcholine can't attach because you've already put curare in, that, in the synapse and attached it to the um, acetylcholine receptors. So it... The curare does not stimulate the muscles, and the acetylcholine can't attach, so it can't cause the muscles to contract. So you end up with wimp muscles or flaccid paralysis. Another toxin that people are very familiar with is botulism toxin. And this is another clostridium bacteria. And this one blocks the release of acetylcholine. So curare allows the acetylcholine to be released into the synapse, but it blocks the site so it can't bind. But botulism doesn't even let the acetylcholine come out of those little vesicles in the bouton. So they're stuck there in the bouton. And it also causes flaccid paralysis. But someone thought, hey, this is kind of cool. So they've actually taken this um, botulism toxin, and they inject it, and that's what a Botox is, botulism toxin. It's for wrinkle removal. So you can't, you can't frown. You can't wrinkle your forehead. I think it's kind of funny because 
the movie stars that need to be beautiful and not have wrinkly faces get the Botox. But then to be an actor or an actress, you need to be able to wrinkle your face and have emotions. And so it would look kind of funny. You're sitting there going, oh, dear, you know, my, my husband is dead. And then you can't wrinkle your face up. So anyway, I think it's kind of funny. So we're going to look at the steps of contraction and relaxation that make up the action potential. So excitation, we talked about, can be done with hormones, or it can be done with electricity. It can be done with the neurotransmitter. And this is where the nerve action potential causes the muscle to have action potentials. Remember that the muscle and the nerve don't touch each other. You have to have a gap. So you can get the electrical depolarization event to occur all the way down to the end of the axon into the bouton. And then you can have the vesicles fuse and you can release the acetylcholine or other neurotransmitter. And then you get the muscle to start up an action potential. So, But you have to have a chemical or an electrical event to go across the synapse. So this original excitation, the depolarization and repolarization, is occurring at the membrane itself. So it's at the sarcolemma, if you're talking about the um, muscle, and the neurolemma, if you're talking about a nerve or a neuron. So now we've got to get that action potential to go down into the myofilaments, which are inside the cell. And then you need them to be able to contract. So you're going to depolarize the, the actual cell membrane, and then it's going to go down and it's going to cause the myofilaments inside to contract. And once you've gotten this uh, process going, which we're going to explain in just a second, then the muscle will contract, and then you have to relax it. So you run out of energy. You have to repolarize it and get it ready to go again. In the next chapter, we'll learn about what calcium does in the nerve that's coming in, but the calcium enters the axon terminal, the bouton, and it causes the vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release the neurotransmitter. And then it binds to the neurotransmitter. And so here's one of the uh, receptors for the neurotransmitter. Now we're going to look at one acetylcholine receptor. And there's the sarcolemma. There's the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. And here's the acetylcholine bound on there. And now it opens up the ion gate, allowing the uh, potassium to come out and the sodium to rush in. So what open and closes this to allow the ions to go across the membrane is the binding of this. So they call it a ligand regulated ion gate. So these are the ions, the potassium and the sodium are the ions, and the ligand is the thing that binds. In this case, it's acetylcholine. Now that we've had the sodium and the potassium changing places, you're actually causing an electric current to run through the membrane. And this is called a voltage-regulated ion gate. And so because the voltage is changing across the membrane, it's going to allow more sodium, more potassium. So the next thing we're going to see occurring is, remember that we talked about the endoplasmic reticulum and how it can move things around inside of cells. Well, in the case of the muscle fiber, we're going to call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. And one of the main things that we're moving around in it is the uh, calcium. So here's the action potential 
going down the T tubules right here, and this is, causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the calcium. And once the calcium has been released, it's going to bind to the troponin, and the troponin is going to cause the tropomyosin to come off of the active sites of the actin. Here's an oldie but a goodie. It's about a one minute video and it shows you what goes on step by step. So here's a review. Sorry about that. Here's a review showing you the I band, the Z disc, the actin, the myosin. You have those little heads with the golf clubs on the myosin. Here's another Z-band right there, or Z-line, or Z-disc, depending on which book you're reading. So from here to here, remember the sarcomere, and when the muscle is relaxed, the actin is as far apart as it can be. So it's held back on this Z-line right there. Now, when the muscle contracts, this actin is going to be ratcheted towards the middle, and this one's going to be ratcheted toward the middle. And then you don't see these light and dark bands anymore. All right, so let's see that in action. So I'm going to stop it periodically and show you what's going on because it goes rather quickly. So you have to put ATP on the myosin head and then you pull off one of the phosphates. So you're getting a burst of energy. The next thing that you're going to see is calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it's going to bind to the troponin. So here's the troponin and it is sitting on the um, tropomyosin right there, which is covering up the active sites on the actin. So we've had ATP come in, phosphate has been pulled off, so this is going to cock the head of the myosin molecule. And then you've got to have the calcium in there that's going to move this out of the way so that the myosin can do what it needs to do. All right, now it's moved out of the way. And you can see the active site. And the head of the myosin attaches in several places all the way down. It's amazing when you watch this to think of all the different ways that something could go wrong that would cause your muscle not to fire. Not getting enough acetylcholine. Not being able to break it down once you're finished with it. Not getting enough calcium not having enough ATP energy to, to keep on going on. It's, it's amazing that our muscles work as beautifully as they do. All right, so the binding of the myosin triggers energy discharge, and the head moves and releases the ADP. So this is the power stroke. Pay attention while one of these is doing the power stroke and pulling the actin along with it. Another one is binding because this one's going to have to let go in order to reach down and grab another place and pull again. So it's a ratcheting effect. But you can't have everyone let go at the same time. I've watched some of the videos that are a lot nicer than this one. And a lot more uh, 
sophisticated and technologically advanced, and they have all the heads attaching and all the heads letting go at the same time. Well, if that happened, then this fiber would just slide back down because it's being pulled back towards the Z-disc. All right, so let's see what happens next. So that one pulled it forward, but this one is attaching back here. All right, now ATP binds to it, and so it's going to let go. And now this one has a power stroke. Okay, so they have to take turns. So all of these heads all the way around are doing this. We're just looking at two that are that are moving along. So this one's going to pull it forward, and this one's going to grab hold. And then this one's going to pull it forward, and then this one's going to grab hold. And so by taking turns, they're going to pull the actin, or pull the myosin along the actin. The video that I showed you showed two molecules of calcium binding to the troponin and pulling it off, uh, causing the tropomyosin to pull off of the active sites. And this one's just showing that there's one. And if you go out onto the web and you ask how many binding sites are there for calcium on troponin, it goes, oh, there's four of them. I guess that's one of the reasons they asked me to edit anatomy textbooks, because I find discrepancies like that. Anyway, calcium, however many molecules, binds, pulls the tropomyosin off, exposes the active sites, and the myosin head is able then to attach and then pull the actin along. Every time you pull a phosphate off of ATP and turn it into ADP, you get that burst of energy. In this case, we're going to use the energy of pulling the phosphate off to cock the head, to actually cock it. And so when it lets go, it pulls. Again, I like the video better because it doesn't show just one myosin attaching, pulling, and then letting go, because that wouldn't get you anywhere. All right, now I'm ready to relax. So I'm finished with whatever that nerve was telling the muscle to do. I don't need it to do it anymore. So I need to break up the acetylcholine. So I'm going to get it off of here. And now that ligand gated um, receptor is closed. So now I can't get the sodium potassium through there anymore. So that's going to give the sodium potassium pump a chance to build the electric current back up across. I need to get the calcium out of there and put it back into the endoplasmic reticulum, which is known as sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once I have removed the calcium, then the tropomyosin is going to cover up the active sites, and there's no place for any of the myosin heads to attach anymore. So they're just going to sit there and wait until the uh, troponin gets some more calcium, moves the tropomyosin off, exposes the active sites, and allows the heads to attach again. So this is the relaxation. We'll speak in a moment about muscle tone. But you always have some of your muscles slightly contracted. Otherwise, you just go limp and you'd fall out of your chair. So when you're asleep, you're going to relax a lot more muscles than you are when you're sitting up in a chair or when you're up walking around. So we're going to talk about how you get a strong contraction versus how you get a weak contraction. So if you've already got some muscle tone going on, if you already got some muscle contraction happening and you try to um, contract more, since you're already contracted, you're only going to get a weak contraction because the thick filaments just run up against the Z-disc and they won't go any further. I mean, that's as far as you can do. So if you already have a short muscle, 
because you've already contracted it partially, then you're not going to get much of a contraction going on. If you've stretched it too much, so you've got the actin and the myosin as far apart as you can, then you're also going to get a weak contraction because it's going to have to work harder to ratchet, 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 and try to close the muscle up. So either uh, a shortened muscle or a stretched muscle is going to give you a weak contraction. So there you go. We're starting to talk about muscle tone here. Muscle tone is a, a partial contraction. And there's just the right amount so that you're going to get the best bang for your buck, the most strength from the contraction. This is just a graph showing you if it's overly contracted, you're not going to get a muscle contraction because it's already contracted. And if it's overly stretched, you're not going to get a full, strong muscle contraction because it's overly stretched and it's got to ratchet its way all the way down. When a person dies, then rigor mortis sets in. This is um, hardening of your muscles and your body gets stiff. So what happens when you die is you no longer are going to be putting the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's going to be out there. It's going to bind to the uh, troponin, which is going to expose the active sites on the actin by moving the tropomyosin off. And then the myosin and the actin couple. They stick together. But now... You can't, you can't make ATP because you're dead and your mitochondria have died. So they can't make ATP for you. And so now you can't move the head. So the muscle contracted, but it can't relax. In order to relax, you gotta, you've got to be able to allow the um, troponin to release its calcium. And then it's going to allow the tropomyosin to cover up the active sites. But you can't do that if you can't get the calcium off and if you don't have the ATP to move the heads. So you end up with your muscles contracted. And so it feels like you're stiff or you're hardening. And this is going to continue on until the actual myofibrils start to decay. So about 12 hours after you've been dead, the enzymes are going to start digesting these proteins. And once they've digested, then rigor mortis um, releases. And the muscles release because you've literally, you're liquefying the muscles. So this is one of the things, if you watch True Crime or CSI or any of those TV shows, then it, it tells you, you know, oh, they're in full rigor. So you say, okay, well, they've only been dead this length of time. Or rigor mortis has already come and it's leaving, and so they've been dead this length of time. So we've gone and looked at the actual molecular occurrences, the individual molecules that are causing these effects to happen, the actin, the myosin, the troponin, tropomyosin, calcium, sodium, potassium those things that go together to make up a muscle contraction. But now, remember when we were looking at the deltoid muscle? And you can contract the deltoid muscle and cause your arm to swing forward, or you can contract a different part of your deltoid muscle, and you can cause your arm to swing out and go up over your head, or you can... Um, contract the posterior portion of it, and it causes your hand and your arm to reach behind you. So you have to have control over various parts of a muscle. So it's not like every time you use a muscle, the whole muscle contracts. So think about shaking someone's hand. Do you need just a gentle amount of, of pressure 
So you're going to use your muscles just enough to squeeze the other person's hand so that they know that you're sincere without trying to crush their fingers and show them that you're the alpha. So you have this ability to, to think about how much pressure you're going to use. If you decide, oh, I'm not going to shake your hand, I'm going to pick up a chair and offer it to you for a place to sit. You're going to have to use a whole lot more muscle power to pick that chair up and move it over towards the person than you would have if you had used your hands to shake the person's hand. So this is one of the things if you're studying robotics, think about the robotic hand and how much pressure to exert. So I watched some of the videos of some of the earlier robots and they try to pick up a can of Coke or something and they end up uh, crushing the can because they apply too much pressure. So it you really don't think about it, but you you have such control over how much pressure that you put. And uh, just to give you an example, when your mind tells you that you're going to need a certain amount of energy, for example, you see a big box and you think, oh man, I'm going to have to really get some recruitment of my muscles. And I'm going to have to fire a lot of the muscle fibers in order to be able to pick that box up. And then unbeknownst to you, somebody's taking everything out of the box. So you bend over and you pick it up and you almost throw it over your head because you use way too much muscle power to pick it up when it was just an empty box. But you thought it was going to be heavy. So if you think how fluidly you walk, and then you think what it was like when you very first learned to walk, I thought I'd just remind you. Here's a little video clip of a baby first learning to walk. Did you notice that the baby was kind of vibrating and wiggling a little bit? Because she was trying to fire her muscles to remain standing upright, but she didn't know how many or where to fire those muscles. This will help you understand about muscle twitches and having successive mus muscle twitches that make a strong enough muscle contraction to do whatever it is that you want. So in the beginning of this talk, I showed you the muscle of a frog where they've taken the leg off of a frog and then they've run electricity through it so you can see it jumping. So when we looked at a myogram, a chart of the strength of the muscles contraction, so that's what that tracing was. So if you have just a little bit of a voltage, if you don't have enough, you're not going to get a muscle twitch. You're not going to get, you're not going to reach threshold, and you're not going to get the action potential. So we know that there has to be a certain amount of electricity that's involved in order to get the muscle to fire. Once you reach that threshold, then you're going to get a, an all or none. You're going to get a depolarization event. You're going to get a twitch. So you send the message that you need this muscle to, to, to fire, to contract, and uh, you, you have a latent period, just a very short period, because think of all the things you got to do. Okay, you got to get the acetylcholine across, you got to get the sodium potassium, you got to get your ligand gated, you got to get your voltage gated thing going, then you got to get the calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you got to move the, the uh, tropomyosin off, you have to get the ATP to cock the head of the myosin. So you got all this stuff going on. So you can have just a little delay. Uh, not, I mean, it's like a very small fraction of a second. And then you can contract. And then you relax. And the whole thing is between 7 and 100 milliseconds. So if you took a second and divided it up into a thousand pieces, 
it would be seven of those thousands or a hundred of those thousands. So way less than a second in order for the whole thing. So when they talk about a latent period, they're not talking about you know, waiting a couple of minutes. They're talking about just a little tiny fraction of a second that it's going to take. And then your your muscle is basically dead until you recharge it. So just like your battery in your phone, if you use it, you're going to have to recharge it before you can use it again. So here it is drawn out for you in a graph. So you're going to stimulate the muscle, and then you have this little latent period, and all of a sudden, bang, you're going to contract, and then you're going to relax. And you're going to wait for the next stimulation. So here are some of the words that you guys need to, to add to your vocabulary. Recruitment is a word you need to know. So you're not just using one muscle or two muscle fibers, you're adding more and more and more until you get the desired effect. So if you've ever watched somebody pick up dumbbells, you know, those huge uh, weightlifters, then you see them start, and you can see them start straining, and they're recruiting. They're like, okay, that's not enough muscle fibers. And so then they try to recruit some more, and they go, okay, that's not quite enough muscle fibers. And you can actually see their muscles as they're recruiting more and more muscle fibers. And then eventually, they get to the point where they have enough recruitment of muscle fibers that they can actually lift the, the weight up and do whatever it is they were trying to do. And these are the two parts of a myogram. So one of them, you're going to be actually measuring how much electrical stimulation that you were applying. So this was not enough to get to threshold. And so down here on the muscle twitch, there was no muscle twitch. This one didn't make it to threshold either, but it got a little better. And you still don't get a muscle twitch. And this one made it just to the threshold, so you get just a little bit of a muscle twitch. And this one made it to the threshold and beyond, and so you get a bigger muscle twitch. So this is, they're showing you that each time you get a f one uh, nerve fiber excited, two, four, so depending on the uh, amount of excitation, that's how big of a contraction. And then there comes a point where the muscle can't contract anymore. That's it. So unless you exercise and exercise and get your muscles stronger and stronger and stronger, that's it. That's the limit right there. So it really doesn't matter even though you keep giving it more, more, more electricity. It's like, sorry, Charlie, this is, this is the best I can do for you. This is, we're, we're, we're done. All of the muscle fibers are contracting. So this is kind of what that baby was doing. The baby was sending a message, you know, saying, okay, I need to stand up. Okay, I need to stand up. And so the muscles were, were working, but they were, they were glitchy. They weren't working exactly right. And then she kept falling down. She would, she would stand up and fall down. And she would almost get up, and then she ended up having to crawl a little bit. So this is not what we want. We don't want individual twitches like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to decrease the interval between stimulation. So this is what the muscle twitch would look like. Contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. And this is, this is not what we want. The, you'll just end up twitching and jerking. And that's when you're trying to pick something up, you don't want your hand twitching and jerking. You want a nice fluid motion. So what you're going to do is you're going to send the stimulation and cause it to twitch. But then before it can completely relax, you send another stimulation and go, that's not enough. And so then it twitches again. And then it says, no, no, that's still not enough. And so it twitches again. And so you have this summation. And eventually you're going to get just the right amount of stimulation 
to cause your muscle to, to uh, continue to fire in tetany. And so you're thinking, well, wait a minute, tetanus is not something I want because tetanus is when my muscle gets locked up because of that um, toxin, you know, that comes from the dirt. And so that's not a good thing. Well, unfortunately, the, the word tetanus for the disease and the word tetanus for when you have a nice fluid muscle contraction are the same word. So that's a little confusing. But this complete fused tetanus or tetany is exactly what you want. Now, this person, if it's a ballerina, is going to look so fluid. If it's you holding a cup of coffee, your hand is going to be steady. Your, the cup is not shaking in your hand. So you have your muscles firing continuously in one smooth contraction. Now remember, one will contract and then relax, and another will contract and relax. But you've got it going just right so when one of them relaxes, another one contracts. So the net effect, the overall effect, is if your muscle is remaining contracted because you're, you're synchronizing the firing of your different muscle fibers. So here you have a stimulus and a stimulus. And here you have your stimuli coming much more rapidly. And here you have them just the right amount so that you have tetany and you have a fluid motion. So here's another uh, picture. In some books, they call this trepe. And then there's your wave summation. And then there's tetany or tetanization. All right. And I would like for you to know the difference between isometric and isotonic muscle contraction. So when we talk about physics and we talk about work, Work is the movement of something over a distance. So if you walk over to a wall and you start pushing on the wall, you're not going to move the wall. You're just not strong enough. So you're going to push and you're going to push and you're going to push. So you feel like you're doing work, but by the definition of work, you didn't do anything because you didn't move the wall. So you may be exhausted, you may be sweating, your muscles may be quivering like jelly, but you actually didn't do any work because you didn't move anything. So when you're talking about isometric muscle contraction, this is where you're, you're firing the muscle, but the muscle stays the same length. It doesn't contract. So you're not moving anything. So... Isometric exercises are good for holding your posture because I don't want to be sitting in my chair jerking and twitching and falling over and doing any of that stuff. I want to sit in my chair and I want to look cool and calm and collected. And that's going to require joint stabilization, postural mus muscle function as they call it there. So that's isometric. But isotonic is where you use your muscle to actually pick something up. So you're actually moving the muscle, contracting it or lengthening it. And I don't care if you learn these terms or not, but there they are. If you are shortening your muscle, they call it a concentric contraction. And if you're lengthening your muscle, it is an eccentric contraction. So here's a picture of a girl doing all three. Here she's just holding the dumbbells. So she is doing muscle contraction in there, but she's not shortening or lengthening it. She's just holding it. And uh, it's interesting how long you can hold something before you drop it. If you've ever watched somebody moving furniture into a house, and then they're going and they're going, and all of a sudden they go, i got to put it down right now. Because they know that their muscles are going to stop. They can't recruit enough muscles to keep the tetany, to keep the smooth contraction going. And so they're going to drop the piano or drop the couch. 
here she is shortening her muscle, here she is lengthening her muscle. So both of these would be isotonic and this would be isometric. So this next section talks a little bit about how do you get the energy to do what you do? How much oxygen do you need? How do you get that calcium? Things like that. So you're going to use glucose or other foods to provide your energy. But they generally look at the glucose because it's the most studied and we know the steps that go through glycolysis and we go through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport system. So you, you have a glucose, which is six carbons, and you break it in half and you have two three carbon pieces called peruvic acid and then you send them on into the mitochondria and they very obligingly pull the carbons apart, send off carbon dioxide, send out water, and they just crank out ATPs for you. So that's what happens if there's oxygen available. But let's say you're doing a marathon or you have emphysema because you're a smoker and you can't get enough oxygen. So what you're going to do is instead of going to glucose to peruvic acid and on to the mitochondria, you're going to make lactic acid because you don't have oxygen available. Anybody who remembers the first day of PE, I don't know if they still do it, but in my day, the first day of PE, the PE teacher forced us to exercise the entire period. We had to do jumping jacks. We had to run around the gym. Uh, all of these exercises, one right after the other after the other. And the next day when we woke up, we were so sore that we couldn't hardly get out of bed. And uh, I guess the point was to show us that we were lazy and, and our muscles weren't any good, you know, that we couldn't do all that stuff without hurting. And uh, all it did was just make me hate P.E., so I hope they don't do that anymore. But what happened was I was using muscles that I wasn't used to using and I wasn't able to get enough oxygen there to make the ATP that I needed. So I started making lactic acid and it builds up in your muscles and it hurts. So here's a couple of cartoons I thought were funny. So here's the brain talking to the muscle saying, hey, you're looking good, exercise paying off. And the muscle goes, every moment is agony. And the brain says, good, that means it's working. And then here's a girl going, whew, I worked out, but I don't feel sore. Did it work? And then, yeah, yeah, it worked. All your muscles are screaming. So those of you who are going to be a personal fitness trainer, let me just clue you in. I've had personal fitness trainers who, like the PE coach, ended up at the end of the session hurting. I hurt so badly that I thought, I can't do this. And then I had some that knew just how to work each muscle just enough that they didn't overwork any set of muscles. And so I, I left refreshed, and I didn't hurt anywhere. And so the next day I was ready to go at it again. Instead of limping in, going, ah, oh, I hurt too badly to exercise today. So a good um, workout fitness coach can get you into shape without making you hurt. In order to make ATP, you've got to have some food source. Glucose is great. Uh, carbs, eating carbs, get you some good uh, glucose. But you can also burn fatty acids. So one of the things that disturbs me now is uh, these keto diets where you don't get enough glucose and it forces you to burn the fat that's in your body. But if you burn too much fat too quickly, then you end up with ketoacidosis and it can kill you. So people who are playing around with these keto diets, if they don't know what they're doing, can get into a lot of trouble. So enough said about that. 
So one of the neat things that muscles have is myoglobin. It has a higher affinity for oxygen, so it can hold more oxygen, but it is rapidly depleted. One of the things that lets you know that you've had muscle damage is if you're if you're releasing the myoglobin and it's not in the muscles anymore, then it's going to work its way and the metabolites of it are going to work its way into your urine and you're going to start peeing um, a blackened pee. So if you see that, then you probably want to go talk to a doctor and tell them that you've been over-exercising or you're having some problems with your muscles. Here's a slide telling you in words what I was telling you before. If you don't get enough oxygen, then you can still make a little bit of ATP, not a whole lot, but enough to keep you going. But the price you pay is you make lactic acid, which is also known as lactate. This is just a um, rough rule of thumb, I guess you would call it. This is completely different for little kids, for athletes, for old people, for men, for women. So, But in general, you if you're exercising, you're going to get energy from glucose and you're going to be breaking down fatty acids. And then after 30 minutes, you, you've run out of glucose. You've run out of um, glycogen which is a storage form of glucose, and now you're having to rely on fatty acids. So this is why so many people who exercise a lot, long-distance runners and so on, are uh, skinny. There are some people who exercise so much, ballerinas, um, people who work on the balance bars, gymnasts. They actually exercise so much that a lot of times the women stop menstruating and they can't get pregnant because they don't have enough fat in their body to maintain uh, a menstrual cycle or to maintain a pregnancy. And here's just some of the things that can cause you to uh, lose your endurance, to, to fatigue, to have to stop doing whatever it is you're doing. And one of them, I just start at the bottom, psychological will to persevere. So sometimes you just, it's in your mind. I can't do it. And so you can't do it. So, and then a lot of times you'd hear about people, they hit a wall, not physically, they run into a wall, but, but they're, they're just exercising, they're doing, they're, they're uh, shoveling snow or they're raking leaves or whatever they're doing and all of a sudden it's just like okay man I have no energy and you think oh man but I just have this last little bit I got to do so you just kind of power through it you gotta I'm just gonna force myself to do it and all of a sudden you get like a, a second wind so I think that's interesting and they, they, they said we don't actually know what all is going on there um, another thing that you're going to do is if you're exercising, you're going to be releasing ammonia into your bloodstream. And, and as you build up more and more ammonia and you don't have a chance to pee it out, it's going to inhibit your brain cells and your brain's going to you know, start stop sending messages that you need to keep on doing something. So there's a lot of different things, running out of glycogen and glucose, running out of oxygen, um, um, a buildup of potassium. So there's there's several things that can happen. Uh, excess sweating, so you lose your electrolytes. Remember, you've got to have sodium potassium or your muscles won't fire. This is one of the things, whenever you see little kids out playing soccer or t-ball or whatever, the moms and dads will bring oranges, orange slices, or something to, to replace the electrolytes for the kids. And another thing that I teach about is uh, what we call runner's high. And I'm, I can teach about it, but I have never experienced it. I don't, I don't work out that hard. <laughs> but 
normal people, they have all their hormones and they fall in love and have relationships. But people who over-exercise, they actually make a substance that's a little bit like opium. And it is, uh, you have uh, your endorphins and your encephalins that are in your bloodstream, and they are helping you with the pain of over-exercising. And so they've actually shown that some people will over-exercise to the point where they'll actually die. You know, they, they love the runner's high. It just feels so good. You know, they hit that wall, and then they just keep going. And then these, these pain relievers, natural opiates that you put in your body, make you just feel so good. And so you over-exercise, you don't eat enough, and uh, you'll end up having a heart attack. So that actually happened to a friend of mine. He was a biker, and man, he loved to ride bikes up mountains, down mountains. Here's a few things that are kind of, um, some are controversial, and some are kind of like, duh. So how much oxygen you can use how long you can exercise depends on your body size. Obviously, a weightlifter has a much a bulkier uh, muscle mass, and so they're going to be able to work out longer than somebody who doesn't have very much in the way of muscle mass or has replaced their muscle with fat. It peaks around the age of 20. So if you want a lot of uh, athletic ability, you're going to want somebody around the age of 20. Sometimes you have a remarkable athletes that go on into their 30s, but um, you, you don't see as much of that. And this is the one that's controversial because a lot of females say, anything a man can do, I can do. Well, usually, unless the woman has really, really worked out, it, uh, she can't do as much as males. They have more testosterone, and they have more muscle mass, and they have more red blood cells. So they're physiologically equipped to do uh, more exercise and, and a stronger contraction of their muscles than females. Although I'd like to see some of these athletes give birth. You talk about exercise. But you can, you can train yourself. The endurance athletes can uh, carry a lot more oxygen. One of the things that they found is if you exercise, you will elevate your metabolic rate. So you may not burn off that many calories by doing whatever exercise you're doing, but you continue to burn calories even when you're winding down and you're relaxing. Also, if you over-exercise and you built up lactic acid, you, you've got to get oxygen to the liver so it can convert it back to pyruvate and you can go back uh, into normal ATP production. When we come back for part three, we're going to talk about why some of the muscle cells or muscle fibers can contract very quickly, like in eight milliseconds, and others are a lot slower.